expert inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm joined by John Fisher, who's all the way, as they like to say here, across the pond. It's a rather large pond, but and uh, in the UK, in Preston, in the northeast of England. How are you doing, John? Uh, I'm good, thank you, John. Thanks for having me. And I have to say, hearing that it's sunny in California is quite depressing when it's raining heavily here. Um, so it's a, a damp day is the best way to describe it here. But yeah. we can't let that get us down, can we? No, no. And having grown up in Ireland, like I always tell people here, we only have... Uh, we only have one rainy season in Ireland. Unfortunately, it starts on January 1st and ends on December 31st. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're the same. Yeah. yeah. All right. So John has worked for a variety of companies, including BPP, GP Strategies, Train 2000, Balfour, BT Utility Solutions and BAE Systems, designing and delivering leadership and personal development interventions, coaching and project management. Um, and uh, you are you were an experienced coach and trained counselor works from a constructivist perspective that encourages in individuals to explore their own solutions and we're going to talk about change and you have a methodology the Fisher curve and its implications for managing effective organizational and personal change so um, John the, the subject of change is always just really interesting because mm. Our lives are always in flux. Everything's always changing, but we have this human kind of resistance to change. It's kind of a, it's almost a paradox, right? Mm. Yeah, very much so. It's, um, it is one of those peculiarities that we resist change, yet we're constantly changing. Uh, and one of the, the uh, I think it was Epictus or something like that, one of his statements that really resonate with me, is you can't put your foot in the same river twice because the river's changed and you've changed. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those ironies that we do dislike change, but we constantly do it. And I think it, part of that influences our attitude towards major change and our attitude towards how we see things in general and whether we look for the solution, the opportunity, or what we're missing and in some ways i think that links in with sales mm -hmm. in um, selling the benefits uh, against what we see in adverts sometimes is just insulting or pulling down the opposition the positive or the negative sales mm -hmm. And, uh, and the interesting thing about, uh, as you said, about changes is it's constant and that, but uh, but we resist it. So the whole point of the whole idea of, you know, change management and preparing for change and all that, mm. something that most people would say, yeah, you know, it's very important. You've got to have that in place and everything. But a lot of lip service is paid to it. And a lot of things are just kind of rolled out with any proper change management process. Yeah, very much so. Um and interestingly, if, if um, we go back to Machiavelli and his classic book, he talks in there about change and about managing change and some of the things you have to do to prepare the groundwork to manage change that we seem to have forgotten. And we don't do enough, I think, preparation for change and we don't engage with the people who are going to be changed enough mm -hmm. and we almost force feed it to them which invariably means they react negatively against it and either actively or passively sabotage the change and i think companies also self-sabotage a little bit in a lot of really big change initiatives and the common consensus is five to ten years for a big change initiative. Right. After a year or two, companies sort of give up because they've either lost the will and do something different because it hasn't paid any benefits quickly enough that then gets the workforce even less enthused about the next change because mm -hmm. it's just something on top of on top of yeah. that doesn't work. Yeah, and I think that's what, and I think that's what 
uh, a, a lot of people's experience has been. And, you know, I mean, a lot of people who've been in, a, in, in different jobs and different organizations uh, will be familiar with the, you know, initiative du jour. And mm. uh, and when you when companies roll out an initiative and then it's all big excitement around it and then, as you say, it this this it's not sustained or the other elements of rolling it out aren't there and and so as an employee you figure, initiative du jour, if I just yeah. pay lip service and I wait this out it'll go away like all the other ones do. Definitely, yeah, and had. A real example of that when I started as an internal consultant deploying the latest initiative um, and I was stood with the blue collar workforce in uh, in the company and they were sort of having a go at me and saying that's not true that's not true and why should we and as you were saying hey, if we just ignore this it'll go away and another one will come along what's the point and I learned the trick for me was to put it in context of all of the other initiatives we've gone. And I ended up creating a jigsaw where all of the previous change initiatives came on and then were superimposed by the acronym we'd created for the one I was deploying. And basically saying we wouldn't be here now if we hadn't done everything else. They paved the way for us to get where we are now. And that started making a difference, which really reinforced a fundamental for me that context is all important mm -hmm. and it's all about the context. And I suppose that's my variation of Dan Pink's start with the why and it's start with the context and that includes the why, but it's putting that frame around it that basically says, this is what we need to do, this is why we need to do it. And then the important thing for me is then asking the question of the workforce and how are we going to do it? And what I found makes change more successful is that engagement and a, a relatively trite comment, but change happens one person at a time mm -hmm. and i don't believe organizations change but people do and that's what makes the difference you've got to get the people to change to then come onto the tipping point that then makes it more doing it than not yeah and and the and the part about that too is uh you only have to have one or two people resisting the change for the change to fall apart. It doesn't work quite the other way. It doesn't have one or two no. people embracing it like have to. Um, so unfortunately, it's weighed in that way. So, so how do you when you when you work on change initiatives and and you know with with your explain the Fisher curve, but when you uh, uh, work on change initiatives, how do you how do you make sure that you get everybody? on board because like you said is change happens at the individual level and some people listening maybe say oh wow if i've got a big change project you mean i've got to go and persuade every single person yeah and it's almost that it's almost that um every person needs to be at worst inactively against the change right. so the denial um at worst because if you've got somebody at against the change then you're going to get cells where it just doesn't appear it doesn't work uh, and that will eventually spread through the organization so uh, to link back into into the curve um, that's about our perception of the change the impact we think the change will have in two different ways one uh, I use a little model that I've been here before, yes or no, and this will be good for me, yes or no. And depending where you fit in that four box model depends on how active or inactive you'll be about the change. Uh, and then the curve itself talks about the impact on me as an individual, uh, about how big an impact will it be and what's the impact of the impact on my sense of identity so if i've been a manager for years and i suddenly get somebody coming in saying we're adopting this new style of management you've got to start now being 
LYZ management, whatever that means and mm-hmm. is, um, and you've now got to do that, then depends on who I am. I could I could start internalising that by saying I'm too old to change my ways. I've been I had to change from command and control and told I couldn't micromanager, I couldn't keep on the detail. Mm-hmm. I then had to let people go and do their own thing when some of them are not trustworthy. I'm now being told to do it this way. I don't think I can change. I'm not sure what to do now. I've had so many different people telling me different things. Does that mean I've always been a bad manager? Does that mean that I just don't know what I'm doing when I thought I was quite good (laughs) on that? And that's as we go down into the trough um, of despair, really, or confusion, as I call it, um, in the latest versions. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, yeah, just on that note, John. I mean, that's something I think is really profound that people, you know, just wanted to underline that is how much sense of identity is attached, uh, you know, to the role. And as you said, particularly if you maybe been doing a role for a, for a long time and then mm-hmm. you are asked to change. But it goes back to that thing, the whole context. I mean, if you were asked to change and said, listen, you know, everything's been good. You've done everything great up to now. Like that has worked for us. However, going forward, it's not. We're going to have to do it this way. Yeah. At least acknowledging the contribution rather than just coming in with mm-hmm. the change. Yeah, Yeah, very much so. And I, I've suggested um, the, about a change timeline. And that obviously consists of the past, the present and the future. And what we've got to do is kill off the past, celebrate what worked, celebrate the things that were effective and the achievements we've had in the past, but then effectively close it. Give people closure Mm -hmm. um, and give them a a reason why we've got to change. So the burning platform um, sort of effect. We can't do it like this anymore because Mm -hmm. this, this and this. We've then got to create that future where people understand what they'll be doing, what they'll be saying, where and how they'll be doing and saying it, and give them that vision that's really, really clear that they buy into and they can live with and and where we can get them to co-create it. And then we come back to the present and create the route map. So then that's where it's okay. So this is where we are. How do we now achieve that vision? What steps do we need to take? What do we need to do to then get there? And then we effectively manage that change, that route map, that change plan. And going back to some of Cotter's words about the low hanging fruit, the quick hits, get some achievements under the belt and just keep refocusing back on the vision all the time and keep recognising the steps that we make to get there. And that helps it become more effective than less effective because people feel part of it, they feel engaged. Even if you don't go where they want to go as part of that process, they feel they've had a voice. Yeah. And so often you talk to people in where change has failed and they felt voiceless, they felt disempowered, disenfranchised. Mm-hmm. And if you're lucky, they've left the business. If you're not lucky, they've stayed yeah and and uh there's a there's a there's been some surveys recently and it's just come down to that old fundamentals about what people want they want to be seen heard and understood mm. and mm. If, like you said i mean if you come in with the change initiative and that you're imposing and you're not really i mean the thing you're basically saying is i don't really see any of you people i don't you know yeah. whatever i'm just this is just uh you know something we're going to do and so yeah. that's seen heard and understood it's actually quite simple when you address it. Mm, very much so, yeah. Uh, and there's, there's so much power in that seen, heard, understood. Or seen, heard, acknowledged, mm-hmm. maybe would be how I'd think about rephrasing it from sure. me personally, just because that's me. But yeah, seen, heard, understood, seen, heard, acknowledged is so powerful um, in... in talking to people yeah. but the, 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 what could you do yeah the other thing too though john there's another challenge that you have nowadays is that um we have like five generations in the workforce somebody said six I, um but anyway certainly not the most that's ever been apparently mm. um well maybe 
when there was no child labor laws, there might have been more, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, but certainly in, in the modern times. And but the but the challenge of that is people receive information in in different ways and like to be communicated mm. in different ways in the days of kind of blanket communication so communication as part of the change process is obviously critical but ensuring that that communication is in multiple ways for different audiences yeah. different yeah. very much so and the, the the sad thing in inverted commas for any change agent is you can never over communicate during change no matter how much you communicate it will never be enough we've got to and it, it goes back i suppose to as you're saying you've got to find as many different mediums for communicating that change as you can the uh, the, the newsletters the team briefs mm -hmm. the um video calls, the team calls, the the um, town hall addresses that, that we call them in the UK, where everybody gets together and they get a video of real people standing on the stage and talking at them. Uh, and you've got to find those variety of, of ways to do that. And that came out on the change initiative um, or just after when I first started in this game. And I was part of uh, um, I was part of a group of people that were being moved out of the car business into a, into a new venture startup business that uh, was then going to service the parent the original company. And we got moving out. We got a weekly email that came out. We got a monthly newsletter that came out. We had fortnightly meetings as a sort of department with a half an hour or so state of the nation address mm -hmm. we then as it was becoming closer and closer to live we then had a two three day away day where the whole company got together and did some teamwork did some some work around creating visions and identity and everything and there was a small group of people being left in the original company to then manage that interface. So they were really um, part of David Meister's model, really. They looked after us in a new company and we then provided the expertise back in. And they got nothing. Absolutely no work was done with them about the fact they were, they were staying survivor's guilt was totally ignored and some mm -hmm. of the people lost their best friends into the new company and it ended up that actually those people who stayed in many ways become became saboteurs right. and used to criticize the new organization to the extent we get telephone calls in our um in our customer service department where we had to answer it in the parent company's name and when it was answered in their name the people on the other end of the line would say thank god for that i've got you guys i didn't want the company we were even though that's who we were and it caused a lot of dissatisfaction in an almost a cancer in both organizations mm -hmm. because they were jealous of all the information we'd got and we were frustrated because we were being beaten up um but we were being beaten up unfairly unjustly because they didn't realize it was us doing the work right if that makes sense yeah so no fascinating no and absolutely and i think that really is a great great underlying underlining of the fact is that it's it's the assumptions you make that'll get you in the end, right? If you sort of assume, oh, well, those those will be okay. They don't need to know. Or we don't need to do anything with that group. That group's fine. Yeah. And and it's those assumptions that come back to bite you. Very much so. And it's that in and out group in many ways that creates that resistance. And people look over the wall, think the grass is greener, and. Mm -hmm. Rarely in my experience is the grass greener unless you make it greener when yeah. you've gone and <laughs> fertilise it and make it work. Uh, and so people, 
people look on it with with jealousy and yeah. resent that you've got something they haven't in yeah. many ways and it's the same slightly backwards because people will resist the change and point to how it used to work point to other companies that still do it the same way without being told of or closing the past and being told of the vision and the reasons for change again the context yeah and i think that's great takeaways from today is the context is so important it's important mm. to look back it's important to establish like why this is uh, you know an evolution um the communication aspect and making sure yeah. that everybody's communicated with and don't make assumptions about any groups don't leave any yeah. groups or individuals because they could be the yeah. very thing that undo undoes you in the end and i think the other thing leading from that of course john is you've got to be adaptable yeah. They don't have to adapt, you have to adapt to them. So you've effectively got to talk their language. Mm -hmm. um, something I've used in customer service uh, a few times, Helmut Kohl used to be the Chancellor of yeah. Germany decades ago. And there's a classic um, statement he came out with on, on television that caused a bit of a stir, I believe, in Germany. But he said, if I'm... Was it, if I'm selling, then I'll speak your language. But if I'm buying, then it will speak in Deutsch. <laughs> it's a great, yeah, absolutely. I what a great, love it. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, listen, John, this has been great. What a great way to end. This has been great. All of John's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, do tell people a little bit more about what you do. Okay, thank you, John. So I'm a... Um, chartered occupational psychologist and i effectively do a lot now of coaching one-to-one -one coaching little bit of team coaching lot of team development and leadership management development training uh, just helping organizations become even more effective than they already are um, come from a kellyan perspective personal construct theory which basically says we're all unique individuals but that we all anticipate the future by reflecting on the past mm -hmm. and acting as if that was going to be true mm -hmm. um, so and um, i'm from um, yorkshire in um, in the uk um, which all yorkshiremen are quite proud of being from yorkshire <laughs> And I was at a uh, somewhere once doing a talk, and the lady came up at break and said, uh, "My husband has a saying: never ask if, never ask anybody if they're from Yorkshire, because if they are, they'll have already told you, and if they aren't, why humiliate them?" <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Well, listen, thanks a lot, John. Uh, thank you for today. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again very soon.